Well, hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Closing Arguments. I am your moderator, Ryan Ruff. It's great to be back with everybody today, and in just a moment, I'll be joined by my right-hand man. That's Mr. John Razumich, or Jack Razumich, as many know him by, of Razumich & Associates, and we've got another great episode of the podcast for you guys today. Now, for anybody joining us here on the show today, if you didn't check out our last episode, which is surrounding the state of Indiana versus Richard Allen, in this case that has just been absolutely blowing up of late, I would highly recommend turn around, go press play on that episode and check out that first part of the conversation because there's a lot of great details, background on the case and important things that you're going to want to know before you dive into today's conversation. And for today's conversation, we're going to be moving forward a little deeper into everything, specifically during today's conversation surrounding the Frank's brief and the Frank's motion and hearing. So with that, before uh, before you really get knee deep into everything, let's go ahead and say hi to the man of the hour, Jack. It's good to see you today. How are you doing, man? Ryan, exhausted. Um, <laughs> it's researching this case for the for the podcast has been complicated because every time we think we have it ready to go, some new wackiness happens. That's that's the easiest way of describing mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah. We we had originally anticipated when we did part one of this that that part one would be the background up to the filing of the Frank's motion, and we would pick it up with the Frank's motion and and kind of how we thought it was going to work from there. Since then, um, just just very very briefly, we've had a theft of the crime scene photos, we've had a suicide, we've had the original defense attorneys withdrew from the case. Then they didn't want to withdraw from the case. Then they filed to kick the judge off of the case. Then the judge in open court disqualified them, claiming that they were incompetent. And in the mix of all of this, there are two original actions pending before the Supreme Court of Indiana to try and make everybody act like adults in this. So what I'm saying is, you know, for starters, Ryan's absolutely correct. If, if you've not seen or heard part one, Go do that. Um, the, the the very, very quick version is in February of 2017. Uh, teenagers Abigail Williams and Liberty German were murdered. They appear to have videotaped their murderer, telling them to go down the side of the hill where they were found three days later. And uh, Richard Allen, who is the defendant in this case, was arrested approximately four weeks before an election in Carroll County. And that kind of brings you up to speed as far as like the, the instant recap portion of it. We left off where the Franks hearing is. Uh, we'll pick up there in a few moments. Um, the last thing that I do want to say for the benefit of those of you who are watching this on YouTube. Also, thank you. If you are do all the fun YouTube things like share and subscribe, you're probably going to notice um, my eyes aren't going to focus on the camera as much this time. That's not because I'm suddenly camera shy. This is so dense. There's so much information in this. We scripted it much, much more heavily. Um, that way we can make sure that the information is given to you correctly. I, I don't want to give you incorrect information, give you a false impression of the law. Um, every new like, share, and subscribe is one step closer to getting that teleprompter. So, you know, do, do all the fun YouTube things. <laughs> well, well said. Well, hey, but also, look, information is extremely important in this case. There's a lot of it. And without all of it, you can formulate opinions surrounding one side or another and the direction the case is going. So completely understand there, Jack. We're going to, you know, obviously be uh, be diligent in allowing you to the, the grace, of course, to to you know, check on your notes, but let's go ahead and pick the conversation back up. Then we, we left off talking about the Frank's motion that was, that was filed. Why don't you set the scene for us and maybe even just bring our audience back up to speed on what even is a Frank's motion and a Frank's hearing as a whole. Sure. A, a Frank's motion is an attempt by the defense attorneys to argue that a search warrant is invalid. Um, Hollywood kind of has this misapprehension that search warrants can be invalidated if, you know, an address is off by a number or someone's name is misspelled. Those types of Scrivener errors don't actually get search warrants thrown out. What does get a search warrant thrown out is if the information contained in the search warrant is a search warrant application um, is false, misleading, or otherwise incomplete. The shorthand term for it is referred to as a Franks motion, and that's based off of the uh, the United States Supreme Court case of Franks versus Delaware from 1978. In its most basic form, what a Franks motion is, is you are going before the court and you are telling the judge the police lied. 
because that's what it is. Search warrants are applied for uh, by filing what's referred to as a probable cause affidavit, the same type of probable cause affidavit that you would normally see in a criminal case. It's just a very specific one for the purposes of justifying the search. And that search, th that probable cause affidavit has to be reliable. And it has to show that the officer has actionable evidence and actionable information that justifies the issuance of the search warrant. And with the Franks motion, what's happening is the defense attorneys are arguing that the warrant was issued based on a false statement or a misstatement of facts. It contained false information, or it was made with reckless disregard for the truth, or it contained specifically misleading information that the judge, had they known about the correct information, would not have signed the search warrant. It is a very, very high standard to meet. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's also one of those things that you hear about it in politics all the time, the concept of the nuclear option. This is basically the nuclear option. And you, you, you're going into open court and you're stating affirmatively as an officer of that court that these people lied to the judge. That's, that's huge. You can't take that back. Mm -hmm. Most search warrants that get attacked, they get attacked for structural defects or that they're overbroad or that they see something that, that the warrant didn't cover. Um, but to go right out and, and to just basically say, hey, the cops lied and I can prove that they lied, that's hard to walk back. And, and that's exactly what happened in this case is that the defense attorneys argued, uh, defense attorneys Andrew Baldwin – and Brad Rossi argued that Carroll County uh, Sheriff Liggett specifically lied to the judge in his application for the search warrant on uh, on Richard Allen and his residence. I, I mean, yes, not only can you not walk something back like that, but my goodness, is that a statement to make, like you said, in open court where you better have the firepower behind that statement to be able to make it happen. Otherwise, there is a, you know, a litany of of ripple effects <laughs> that will come of that either way. So so let's get back into the case here at hand. Let's talk about kind of the specific accusation of lying that's going on in this case. Dive into this for us, Jack, and, and uh, show us the light, if you will, and where this really takes the case as a whole. So generally speaking, what we're dealing with here is that the state's public theory of this case is that Richard Allen was acting alone when he killed uh, Abby Williams and uh, Libby German. So to get the search warrant uh, that justified the search of his home, um, Carroll County Sheriff Tony Liggett effectively had to build a case that justified this is why we're focused on this individual and this is why we want to search their home. So keeping in mind that the state's theory of the case, uh, at least for the purpose of the search warrant, was that this is a single person crime, a single person acting alone on this, they needed to connect up Richard Allen with two primary eyewitnesses that were involved in this case, uh, women by the name of Betsy Blair and uh, Sarah Carbaugh. So specifically, um, what the attorneys argued is that uh, Sheriff Liggett deliberately lied about the testimony and the identifications of these two women who supposedly identified Richard Allen as being the, uh, the unidentified bridge man, uh, which is what they called the, the photograph of the man in the blue parka with the, uh, with the newsboy cap. Uh, that they believed was responsible for the abduction and later murder of, of Abby and Libby. Uh, both Sarah Carbaugh and Betsy Blair provided descriptions to police sketch artists of suspicious individuals they witnessed in connection with the overall investigation of this case. Betsy provided her description on February 17th of 2017, which was only three days after the girls were found, and she rated the drawing a 10 out of 10 for accuracy. So basically, she said, yep, that's the guy. That is the guy that I saw. You sketched him perfectly. Now, you would think that a sketch like this, this would be what everyone wanted to put out there. For some reason, that was not the sketch that was released first. Betsy's sketch wasn't released to the public until April 22nd, 2019, which is more than two years after providing the details. And in a fascinating follow-up to that, 
Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter claimed that the individual in Betsy's sketch, the sketch that was provided three days after the girls were found, but not released until more than two years later, that's the person that was responsible for the murders at the press conference. That, that's the statement of the state superintendent, of the Indiana State Police Superintendent. Now, Sarah Carbaugh's description was provided to an FBI sketch artist, so not an ISP sketch artist. She, Sarah, Sarah was in contact with the FBI. She provided her description to the FBI on June 19, 2017. That's the publicly available sketch that people think of of the man that was responsible for this. The sketch was released to the public on, Ju on July 17, 2017. Um, and that's the man that was commonly referred to as the bridge man. If you were to uh, do a Google search for uh, Richard Allen sketch or Delphi murder sketch, the first result that's going to pop up is going to be the guy that uh, Sarah Carbaugh described to the FBI sketch artist. There's one pretty big problem, though, which is that neither of these sketches look at all alike. I, the, the sketches are completely different. They, they are very clearly two different people that have been described by both of these eyewitnesses. And more importantly, neither of these sketches particularly looks like Richard Allen. So this is the identification that Sheriff Liggett is, is claiming this is the same person. What Sheriff Liggett claimed in the search warrant was that the sketches were identical, and that's patently false. He also claimed that Betsy Blair claimed that Richard Allen's black Ford Focus was in a parking lot between 1.30 and 4.30. That's important because that's the timeline that the state believes that the girls were abducted, uh, murdered, and were observed by witnesses leaving the area. The problem with that is the car that Betsy Blair claimed to see resembled a 1965 Ford Comet that was not black. It wasn't even a dark color. So a completely different car from a Ford Focus. I don't know how much of a car guy you are, but the Ford Focus and the Ford Comet look absolutely nothing alike. No, Their bodies are, are completely different. Totally different cars. Yeah, so there's no mistake cars. about it. Yeah, they're, they're completely different cars. They're not the same mm -hmm. color, but Sheriff Liggett puts in a search warrant application that Betsy says, this is the same car. This, this is the car that I saw. This is Richard Allen's car. And again, that is something that is demonstrably false. And the final accusation against Sheriff Liggett was that Sarah Carbaugh, who was the one who, again, provided that first published sketch, claimed that the man she saw was wearing a blue jacket and had muddy and bloody clothing. This is also demonstrably false. Sarah Carbaugh stated the man she saw was wearing a tan jacket, and nowhere in her 2017 interview did she say anything about blood. The conclusion was that if Judge Denier had known about the known that the descriptions didn't match, that the car didn't match, and that the supposedly bloody set of identification Richard Allen's wasn't actually a bloody person, the idea is that the search warrant might not have been granted under those circumstances. That, that goes back to that concept of misleading information or incomplete information that, um, you know, the judge might not have issued the search warrant under those things. And... The only conclusion that anyone has come up, and this is, this is not something that has officially been advanced by the attorneys in the case, but it is one of those things that, that people do draw their own conclusions. This is why I'm spending more time reading my notes as opposed to just freeforming it. There was an election in Carroll County not long after the arrest of Richard Allen was, was, was arrested. The arrest of Richard Allen was made a few weeks before an election in which Sheriff Liggett was seeking office, and the implication at least appears to be that by solving the community's most notorious unsolved crime, Sheriff Liggett would win his election in a landslide, which he actually did. He won handily. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not a, a Carroll County resident. I can't tell you how close the election may or may not have been before then. I know that once Richard Allen was arrested— all of a sudden, you know, Sheriff Liggett rides to rides to election handily. Uh, mm. Is that enough of a motive to to lie? I don't know, but there are very clear issues in that search warrant application that can demonstrably be shown that this information is not correct, and that's a problem. Yeah, Jack, there's a lot to digest here. Uh, by way of, I mean, there, there's a lot that I think our audience is probably scratching their heads about right now, especially 
you know, on the heels of, of the election right around there. So, so given that, and given the fact that the Frank's motion, you know, was filed, be given, you know, this just plethora of, of examples as to why they felt that there might be some foul play going on here. What ultimately does the defense think happened? You know, what, what, there's a lot of speculation that can go around, but what is the event? What is the defense's true intention? And what do they think ultimately did in fact happen? If you're not wearing seat belts, all of you should find <laughs> seat belts and buckle them in right now because this is about <laughs> to get bumpy. As part of the argument, Richard Allen's attorneys filed a 136 page memorandum in support of the Franks motion. That's actually pretty common. Most proceed, a lot of procedural things under Indiana law, like a motion to dismiss, a motion to suppress, will sometimes require the filing of a brief or a mem memorandum in support of it. This was no different. The 136 page memorandum that was filed in this case ultimately alleged that the murders were really committed by a white supremacist pseudo religious cult called the Odinites. Now, I'm going to do my best to try to explain how this ties into the Frank's motion before we get to the end of the episode. I will admit it is not quite as strong as the other evidence that they provided with regards to Sheriff Liggett's misstatements regarding the identifications and the testimonies of Sarah Carbaugh or, uh, or Betsy Blair. But there is at least a tentative argument that the defense makes to kind of support that. And the way that it was concluded that there may have been, for lack of a way of describing it, a ritual sacrifice involved, it was pretty unorthodox to say, to say the minimum. During the investigation process by the defense, they received a letter that was sent to Carroll County Prosecutor Nick McLeland by former Rushville Assistant Police Chief Todd Click. This letter was dated May 1st, 2023. And after reading Richard Allen's probable cause affidavit, Officer Click became concerned that the information contained in Richard Allen's affidavit pointing the finger at Richard Allen uh, was far less compelling than the totality of the information that Detective Greg Ferency, Detective Kevin Murphy, and Officer Click had accumulated during a Rushville portion of their investigation. Now, where that's interesting is Rushville's nowhere near Carroll County. Rushville is in Rush County. Um, every great once in a while, we do name our county sensibly. There's about 125 miles between Delphi and Rushville. It's, they're not neighbors in any stretch of the imagination. So for officers 125 miles away to say, hey, we gave you a lot of information. Why are you following up on this? What's missing? Your probable cause affidavit does not really seem to be pointing at the right guy. It's not compelling that's very obviously gonna raise eyebrows from the defense team. And that's exactly what happened with this. So what happened with this is the information that Murphy, uh, Ferency, and Click had gathered during their investigation connected men who practiced Odinism in or near Delphi with another group of men who lived in Rushville and then connected both groups of men to the murders. Click was concerned that for some reason, the leadership of the investigation team failed to share with Prosecutor McLeland the evidence gathered by Click, Ferency, and Murphy. So the idea was not that the prosecutor had done something wrong. The idea initially was like, maybe he just doesn't know. You know, maybe this wasn't brought to his attention. We're going to bring it to his attention to make sure that he's doing the right thing and getting his job right. That's actually what we want the police to do is kind of stay on top of this stuff. So the major bombshell of Officer Click's letter was that according to the summary of Click's investigation that, uh, that he attached with the letters, he, 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 he sent a letter to the prosecutor, attached a summary of his investigation. Part of this bombshell was that the behavioral analysis unit of the FBI determined that the individual or individuals responsible for the homicides were involved in Nordic beliefs. So you have the FBI telling officers here in indiana it looks like this is some sort of nordic sacrifice thing that's not what happens in indiana that's what i know what happens anywhere it's 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 one of those things where it really does start to kind of make this come across as this bizarre fictional narrative but it gets weirder 
it was revealed after this information made it to the defense team that the law enforcement personnel in charge of the investigation claimed to have consulted with an unidentified professor at Purdue University regarding possible pagan symbols located at the crime scene. Purdue University, for those of you who aren't Indiana residents, is about maybe 50 miles um, west-ish of, of Delphi. So like neighboring, the neighboring universities, one of the big, two, big universities here in Indiana. Um, after receiving this letter from Officer Click, that's when it slowly comes out that, oh yeah, we, we knew about possible pagan connections. Um, we talked to somebody at Purdue about this, you know, eight years ago. Um, it's cool, you know, we don't need to follow up on it anymore. That, that literally was the attitude of, mm. uh, of the investigators. Um, according, to, according to the law enforcement personnel that, that were in charge of the case, the unidentified professor allegedly claimed that it was not Odinism or any cult that was responsible for the crime. Now, the problem is that at deposition, the officers were unable to identify who this professor was, had no reports or emails from this professor, and they're claiming now that they have no way of identifying who it was that they spoke with back in 2017. Yikes. Yeah, oh, so my just, goodness. Just think about that for a second. You, you have... You you have a major homicide, and and I'm gonna we'll get into just how strange this crime scene is described to have been. But you have a crime scene that looks like I don't know this might be some sort of sacrifice or something like that. That's really weird. You don't say anything about it to the defense until you're forced to. Then you say, oh, yeah, we totally talked to a professor at Purdue um, in 2017. He said it wasn't. It's cool now. It's like, but they don't know who they talked to. They don't have any report that says this is not it. This is the investigation that's being put forward to prosecute Richard Allen. Just right. keep that in mind when we're hearing yeah. about the rest of this. But meanwhile, we've got our guy. You yeah, know, meanwhile, it, it, meanwhile, they've got Richard Allen. Richard Allen's working alone all by himself. He totally killed these two girls. Pay no attention to the ritual sacrifices behind the curtain. That's that's the to very new to very new evidence to the yep. public that we oh yeah we did know about that but we just didn't feel it pertinent to bring up. Well, yeah. not a great look. Not a great look so far. Keep keep going, Jack. Take us through it. All right. So for those of you who are listening or watching that might be a bit squeamish. Um, Here's where you might want to kind of turn your radio down a little bit, make sure there are no children in the room, because um, this is where it gets creepy. The reason Odinism is important in this case is at the crime scene, sticks and tree branches were deliberately and carefully, and more importantly, proficiently, placed on each girl in a certain arrangement, mimicking certain runes. The crime scene itself was pretty clearly choreographed. To get into more specific detail of how the crime scene looked, both girls appear to have been killed by having their necks slashed open. Now, that's kind of an important detail because up until the Frank's motion was filed, it wasn't even completely clear how Libby and Abby died. That information was not really apparent in the probable cause affidavit that was available to the public. We knew that there was some sort of information about they found a bullet and they thought the bullet was connected to Richard Allen, but this is the first time that you actually had a statement this is how the girls died. Their necks were slashed open. Their necks were, uh, their necks were slashed open. Um, Libby was found at the base of a tree with four tree branches of varying sizes intentionally placed in a very specific and arranged pattern on her naked body. Libby was positioned flat on her back with her left arm stretched above her head, touching the base of a large tree. Libby's right hand was covered in blood. Her left hand was covered. Her uh, her left hand was covered in blood as well. Blood spots and blood drippings were seen all over her body from head to toe. Her right arm was placed along the side of her body, with one large tree branch being placed on her left shoulder. That branch was so long that it extended well above her head several feet and below her legs for several feet as well. Two smaller branches formed a V where her legs joined her body near her genitals with both sides of the V extending upward towards her head with one branch extending to the left of Libby's head and another to the right of it. The last of the four branches extended across her body on a line from her right shoulder to her left shoulder. This fourth tree branch 
also connected the other three branches and was placed under both of them forming the V. Libby's sliced neck was partially covered by this fourth branch. Now, there appeared to be no blood sprayed or dripped onto the leaves or the tree or nearby her head or neck. It appeared that she had probably been killed at a nearby area and then dragged to her final resting place where she was positioned before having the tree limbs placed in this very specific pattern. Abby's body was treated very differently. Abby was found a few feet away from Libby with her body not exactly parallel to Libby, but at an angle with Abby's legs a few feet from Libby's. Now, both of their heads were found a few feet further apart from each other. Now, there were significant differences that existed between how the bodies were found. Abby was not at the base of a tree. Abby was fully clothed. More specifically, Abby was wearing Libby's clothing. She was wearing Libby's undergarments, Libby's sweatshirt, and Libby's jeans. There's no blood anywhere on Abby's clothing, meaning that she was probably murdered while naked and then dressed by the murderers after death and after all the blood had stopped spilling from her neck. Abby's hands were perfectly clean with no blood. Her feet were also clean with no blood. Other than the blood found around Abby's neck area where the murderers had inflicted the fatal wound, very little, if any, blood was actually found anywhere else on Abby's body or clothing. The juxtaposition of the spots or streaks of blood found all over Libby's body with a lack of blood on Abby's body is pretty stark. It, it seems very much that the murders appear to have gone to great lengths to keep Abby's body and clothing free from any blood. Abby was found on her back, but unlike Libby, Abby's elbows were bent with her right and left arms placed on her chest, um, kind of like Dracula style is the easiest way of putting it. If you've ever seen... Uh, the whole concept of a vampire with their arms crossed across their chest. That's that's how Abby's body was placed. Um, Abby's left hand and, um, yeah, the, the, her hands are on the side of her face. Her left leg was straight while her right leg was bent kind of at a right angle at a knee. The murderers also placed that uh, bent right leg under her knee, so kind of like, like a figure four almost. Like Libby, uh, those involved in the murder placed tree branches in a very specific pattern on top of Abby. It looks very similar to an asterisk containing uh, three tree branches all joined in the middle. At least one of these tree branches appears to have been cleanly clipped by some instrument like an electric saw rather than split or broken by hand, which does indicate that this is a preconceived plant. Someone thought this out. This wasn't a crime of opportunity. Above Abby's heads were smaller sticks that had been placed over her hair, crudely mimicking horns or antlers. The amount of blood that would have been expected at a crime scene like that, uh, based on the injuries of both girls, wasn't visible in the crime scene photos at all. This is basically a very sterile, choreographed crime scene that doesn't have the amount of blood that these injuries indicate should be there. And if you think that's weird... You haven't heard anything yet. In addition to the unusual way the girls were posed, including the stick formations placed on their bodies, another unusual marking was found on a nearby tree. A symbol that looked similar to the letter F appeared about four feet above the base of the tree. The F was red in color, and later DNA testing showed that the F had been painted onto the tree using Libby's blood as so-called paint. Additional blood spatter was found at the base of that same tree. All blood around or on the tree appears to have been Libby's blood as well. Under Abby's lower back was a shoe. The shoe is believed to be Libby's. Under the shoe was a cell phone, which is also Libby's cell phone, and that's where the famous video of the bridge man was found on the phone, including the recording, OK, Girls Down the Hill. Additionally, between the two girls, buried under leaves and dirt was a single bullet. That's the bullet that the state claims was cycled out of Richard Allen's gun. This unspent bullet that somehow was cycled out of the chamber was buried between the two girls. Just a single unspent bullet, that's what was buried there. The interesting thing, the, the, the interesting thing from a legal perspective is what isn't found at the scene is any of Richard Allen's DNA. In a world where everyone expects DNA evidence to be the end-all, be-all, certainly for a crime scene like this, a very involved crime scene that, by necessity, required a lot of work to choreograph, mm -hmm. the idea that Richard Allen 
would not have left any DNA there is, is frankly astounding. For as carefully yeah. planned as this is, there's zero forensic evidence tying Richard Allen to the scene of this crime. And it's two two big considerations there. If we double click into that situation, there's the the act and the the fatal wound itself, a very um, violent and and a wound that would exert a lot of blood. Well, and, and then an, there's it's, yeah, it's and then there's the place of the six. Yes, it's, yes, it's a very intimate act. That's there's a reason that that slashers at Halloween use knives. Like you have to be close to the person that you're killing to use a knife. Like guns mm -hmm. are guns are distant. Guns are dispassionate. Mm -hmm. So why? Yeah. So it, it's, there's a few factors here. The bullet casing is, is a question mark. Why right. is the casing even there? Uh, if, if it was clearly a, a slash that killed these two girls, but also the very, very methodical placement of the sticks and all the truly just work manpower it would take to pull that off is astounding that between those two very gruesome crime, like the crime itself, as well as the act of, of just laying out all these sticks that there's no DNA there. That is astounding to say the least. So, so where, where do we go? For, what's the deal from here? Is there any other big crime scene uh, evidence? Sure. I mean, there's, there's a lot that's there. I mean, we're, we're getting a very big overview on this. Um, the, the lack of DNA evidence, I think ultimately is going to become a big factor in this case because a lack of evidence that ties someone to a crime scene is usually a pretty good indicator that folks aren't committing crimes in that area. And again, getting back to the search warrant application, because Sheriff Liggett is asserting that Richard Allen and only Richard Allen is responsible for these murders, the timeline makes it a problem for the state. The timeline requires these murders, including the choreography of this crime scene, take place somewhere between uh, approximately one hour and 44-ish minutes. That's about the timeline that this crime scene is allowed to happen based off of the state's concept on that. We know from the timestamps that Libby's phone records the bridge man at approximately 2.13 in the afternoon. That's the start of the clock for the murders of the two girls. Investigators in this case indicate that they believe the girls died sometime between 2.30 and 3.30, so the time available for the killer to choreograph this time scene is anywhere between one hour and 27 minutes if the girls died at 2.30 on the dot, or 27 minutes if the girls died at 3.30 on the dot. The defense in their briefing identified approximately 92 separate steps that an individual acting alone would need to commit in order to actually conduct this crime as described by the state. These steps included forcibly marching two girls into the woods while controlling with a single gun, forcing the girls to disrobe, restraining them, slicing open one of the girls' neck. It's, it is a little bit unclear as to who died first, whether it was Libby or Abby. But whichever one died first, keeping the other girl from becoming hysterical, killing the other girl, waiting for Abby to effectively bleed completely out, pose Libby, cut down multiple tree branches, arrange them into set dressing, dress Abby in Libby's clothes, pose Abby, finish arranging the crime scene, and they'd have to be back on the road to be seen at 357 by Sarah Carbaugh, since the state's theory is that the man Sarah Carbaugh was both the real killer and Richard Allen, and all of this has to be done while leaving zero DNA or forensic science. That's, that's just <laughs> impossible. It's that's the state's it's, theory it's, of the case. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I mean, wow. Is it possible? Sure. I mean, as an academic theory, sure. all things are possible. Right. I mean, for example, right. the crime scene could have been prepared in advance and the girls could have died quickly and a single killer could have just been incredibly fast and dexterous, but it's not reasonable. Yeah. It's, and yeah. and it's that's possible, the, not probable. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a yeah. key thing that we're always looking at in these cases. Like, is there proof beyond a reasonable doubt? So the defense is arguing that if Sheriff Liggett had been honest with the strong likelihood of more than a single suspect, as was claimed in the search warrant application, Judge Denier would not have signed the warrant. That's part of that connection back with where this Odinite theory started coming from. And, and, and they kept going with it, too. 
so then let's double click a little deeper into this idea of the Odinite theory, because uh, obviously, I mean, when you look at that crime scene, the way the bodies were orchestrated, the the sticks, you know, you mentioned uh, horns or antlers that were almost kind of placed on one of the bodies. Let's let's dig a little bit deeper into the whole Odinite thing. So, so Jack, where does this actually, you know, come into play? Well, I, I, again, the the defense argument about what they believe actually happened is is kind of a bonus argument for people who are reading this memorandum. Um, when the defense was laying the groundwork that it couldn't possibly have been Richard Allen working alone, here are all the reasons why it couldn't have been Richard Allen working alone, like the 92 steps that needed to be done while leaving exactly D- zero DNA. Um, to, to use that as a basis to justify the argument that that Sheriff Liggett was deliberately misleading the court on the search warrant application, they had to be able to back it up. They had, they had to kind of flesh out, okay, um, you know, here's what really happened. And, and, and if you've ever seen the movie clue, um, and if you haven't seen the movie clue, go see the movie clue, not until you're done with this episode, but uh, it's a great movie. It's one of my favorites at the end of it. There are three different endings and there's a, there's a title card, like an old silent movie title cards. Like it could have happened this way, but what about this? Or here's what really happened. That's effectively what the defense did with their Odinite theory. Um, to, to the extent that it was necessary for them to flesh this out, it operated very clearly as an attack on the state's public belief that Richard Allen was alone in committing murders. Once that argument was made, it had to be supported. Um, and this entire line of, of investigation, again, it comes up because the state was withholding evidence. The state was playing hide the ball and not giving information to the defense. They forced the, the officer click letter out of, of the state. And that's what led to the whole concept that's like, huh, there might be some sort of cult sacrifice angle to it. Um, as far as what Odinism is, the best thing that I can do to describe it is to, is to argue that it is a neo-pagan sect that's forced on old Norse mythology. The Southern Poverty Law Center claims that it's a white supremacy group. Um, Southern Poverty Law Center, as much as I respect the work they've done over the years, seems to claim everything's a white supremacy group, so you can take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, But we do know that there have been incidents in legitimate white supremacy groups that do claim that that symbolism that mythology so it's it's at least a valid argument to make based on the way the crime scene was choreographed some investigators including detective murphy became suspicious of whether or not some sort of satanic ritual had taken place and began investigating that direction this investigation first turned up an individual by the name of brad holder and then things went much much further down the rabbit hole from there Now, Brad Holder is a resident of Logansport, which is about 45 minutes from Delphi. His son, Logan, was involved in what's been described as a dating relationship with Abby Williams, one of the two victims. So there is a connection between Brad Holder and one of the victims through his son. And Brad Holder also appears to have had a fascination with Odinite symbology. Things that point to this are the fact that Holder's Facebook page on April 7, 2017, which is a few months after the girls were killed, shows a picture of him showing off an inked rune that the defense claims exactly matches one of the runes that were painted around Abby and Libby. The more disturbing thing, though, is that on February 16, 2017, just three days after the murders, Holder was alleged to have posted a picture on his public Facebook of a very nearly identical scene to the crime scene featuring what appear to be dead women posed in specific manners, complete with tree branches and runes placed on their bodies, much the same way as how Abby and Libby were found. Now, keep in mind, at this point in time, no information about the crime scene was released. So to have someone with a connection to one of the victims post a picture on their Facebook that looks nearly identical to the crime scene that nobody knows about, that is admittedly suspicious. That is extremely suspicious, I would say, it, especially given the timeline. Even if that was after the fact of the crime scene, sure, you could make maybe make an argument that somebody, oh, they're they're you know sick and twisted, and they went back to that area to recreate that, and you know, in terms of just for a laugh or a visual or whatever. But the fact that that was before anybody knew about the crime scene location, well, that is that is a big old piece of juicy info right there. Keep keep going, Jack. It definitely raises a red flag, and that merited further investigation. 
part of the investigation, this is where we finally get over to the Rushville connection. This is where Officer Click comes in, is in Rushville, there was an equally suspicious individual by the name of Elvis Fields. Now, Elvis appears to have been following Brad Holder online, and the defense submitted as part of their briefing nine Facebook posts of Brad Holder that Elvis recreated on his own Facebook. And it seems that beyond just being like a cyber stalker, there's a legitimate connection between Elvis uh, Fields and Brad Holder in the person of a man by the name of Johnny Messer. Now, again, we're giving very surface level issues on this. The actual brief, which by the time this goes up, maybe one of the writs of mandamus will be granted and everyone can read this on their own at that point. But the connection between the two is that Johnny Messer and Brad Holder appear to run in some of the same Odinite circles online. Elvis Fields wanted to join Johnny Messer's um, Odinite group. And it's presumed that they might have met each other through that. They certainly at least became connected with each other. Um, I know a lot of people, some of whom are, in fact, 125 plus miles away from me. But without some sort of kind of connection between the two, the likelihood that I'm going to magically find their Facebook page and then recreate things that they're posting on my own Facebook that's a little bit weird. But that's not why we care about Elvis Fields. The reason we care about Elvis Fields is it seems that Elvis confessed to his sister, Mary Jacobs, that he was involved in the murders of Abby and Libby and tried to give Mary a blue jacket to keep from her, keep for him. And, and if you recall, the actual photograph of the bridge man, the photo that was on Libby's phone, is of a man wearing a blue jacket. So we now have someone in Rushville who says, I was responsible, I was involved. Here's a blue jacket, please keep this from me. So could it be a coincidence? Absolutely, but these coincidences are really starting to add up. Mm -hmm. And where things get really eerie when it comes to Elvis Fields is in December 2018, more than a year and a half after – Mary Jacobs contacted law enforcement in the first place to say, I think my brother had something to do with this. Detective Murphy was present at an interview of Elvis, uh, prompted by Mary continuing to follow up the police on why they hadn't investigated what she told him about her brother's confession. At the interview, Elvis agreed to take a DNA swab, provide a DNA swab for the officer. So he, he agreed to have his cheek swab with the cotton tip so they had his DNA for testing if they needed it. At the conclusion of the interview, and after taking the swab, Elvis asked Detective Murphy, what would happen if his spit was found on one of the girls, but he had an explanation for why it was there? Would he still be in trouble? Yeah, I see your, I see your face. It's like, that seems like huh? a really weird thing for somebody to ask. A police officer investigating the case. Huh. huh. And... You know, Detective Murphy immediately called the Central Command and said, hey, um, we got some weird stuff going on down here in Rushville. And it appears that information got buried. That was one of the reasons why Officer Click was reaching out to Prosecutor McLeland, because that's a pretty big red flag. I'd say so. Wow. You, wow. You just had someone a year ago confess to their sister, I had something to do with the murders. The sister is basically saying, why aren't you talking to my brother? They do a DNA swab voluntarily. Now, I don't know if that's been tested against anything at this point in time. I want to be very clear about that. I don't know if any testing has been done on this. But you do the testing, and then after giving the swab, I was like, hey, so um, if my spit's on these girls, is that bad? <laughs> Am I going to be in trouble if I can explain why my spit's on these girls? Oh, these two goodness. teenage murder victims that are 125 miles away from where we are right now. Can I give you an explanation for that? Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. So what, what does this mean then for Holder or Elvis? It, uh, that's a good question. Cause, cause it gets even weirder where it comes to, to Elvis in an interview on August 22nd of 2018, which is one of the things that kind of reluctantly forced them to go back and even do the DNA swap for Elvis in the first place. Elvis's other sister, Joyce Moffat, indicated that in October 2017, so again, this is the same year. This is, um, this is what, um, eight months after the girls were killed. October 2017, Elvis indicated to her that I am in a lot of trouble. I'm going away for a long time. 
I was on the trail and on that bridge with those girls when they were murdered. There were two other people there with me when it happened, and I spit on one of the girls after they were killed. These are huge red flags. Oh, my goodness. I mean, these are... These are he's, huge. Blow, he's blowing up the defense's case just with that sentence alone. Yeah, because again, remember the state's entire argument is this is Richard Allen working case, by sorry. himself. Yeah, no, I'm, no, no, I'm sorry, the state's case. Yeah, but. this is the state. Everything about this is the 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 state's <laughs> argument is this is all one person working alone. This is all Richard Allen by himself. We not have, only did he he, he just, yeah. oh my goodness oh my goodness he just said that there were two other people involved yeah. he was on the bridge when it happened and his DNA is definitely going to be on that crime scene yeah. oh my gosh now I, I want to be very clear that that none of this means that either Brad Holder or Elvis Fields had anything to do with the murders of Abby Williams or Libby German I want to be very clear about that I am not making that declaration that they were involved or they are responsible for what have you. What this evidence at least presents is, as you pointed out, like this is really blowing up the state's theory of the case. It was already pretty unbelievable with the number of steps that needed to be completed by a single person in an incredibly short period of time to magically leave no DNA, no forensic trace behind. That was already unbelievable that one person had it, was responsible for it you got connections between two people that are separated by 125 miles. And again, I'm giving a very, very surface view of, of that level of it. There were additional things that, that, uh, that Baldwin and Rossi put in their briefing that further connected uh, Elvis Fields and Brad Holder. Um, they were more minutia. We kind of focused on the big things for this one. Um. But the state's theory that Richard Allen was acting alone is mm. really tenuous. So so how is this relevant to the Franks motion? To the extent that you could argue that a judge might not assign a search warrant if there was an alternative and largely unfollowed up theory of what happened, there's an argument that could be made that this somehow did mislead the judge. I'll admit that's a little bit of a tenuous position regarding how – Mm -hmm. misleading information or material misrepresentation of facts are but it definitely does create a lot of of doubt as to what may yeah. or may not have actually happened on this uh jack this is this is a muddy situation uh i mean i i mean the the frank's motion as a whole you gotta come in with some firepower when you're making that kind of motion and boy did the defense i mean there's Absolutely. it 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 blew up the state's case they there's it's really hard at this point after going through all these bit, these bits of information you shared with us to still have that case up from the state holding real weight at this moment and i know we're going to be doing a third part of of this whole conversation so kind of i know we want to spend lar in large part as we have today on the frank's motion and kind of really getting into all these different pieces of information that really blow that state's case up Will any of this work? <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, and also, what would be some kind of final thoughts, final words from you uh, as we look into what what we're going to cover in kind of our third section of this episode and and what is still to come even on this case? To answer your first question about – Will it work? I suppose that depends on what your definition of work actually is. There's technically another section of the Frank's motion that we haven't been able to get to today. We'll, we'll save it for the next episode, just as kind of additional background information to flesh out some more of this, because that does also help factor in with some of the stuff that's happened since the motion was filed regarding allegations that Richard Allen's being guarded by Odinites in prison. Um, that's a pretty wild story that involves them basically filming supposedly confidential communications between attorneys and, and their clients. But, mm. you know, we'll, we'll care. We'll hold that one over for the next, for the next. There we go. We'll tease pretty, you guys. Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's, what's going to be coming. Yeah. Wow. As far as, is it going to work? Um, There's a lot of question right now with regards to who ultimately will be Richard Allen's attorney at the end of the day. Um, 
as far as the Frank's motion is concerned, I don't know if all of this together is enough to justify vacating the search warrant. I think that of the arguments that Baldwin and Razi put forward, I think that the arguments regarding misstatement, reckless disregard for the truth, or if you want to be super aggressive, deliberate falsehoods regarding what Betsy Blair and Sarah Carbaugh provided by way of testimony, that's a much stronger argument to, to argue that the Frank's motion should be granted. Um, the idea that a witness says, I saw this, and a law enforcement officer in a search warrant application put something completely different. That is absolutely that is absolutely something you could potentially make an argument. This search warrant is invalid. Mm -hmm. Regarding the concept of the defense overall, what people need to remember is the number one responsibility of a defense attorney is to raise doubt. It's not our job to explain or prove anything or even disprove anything. Our job is to go in there and say, look, the state has to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. They cannot. And here's reason why I'm poking holes here, 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 and here. This does an amazing job of raising doubt. The question becomes one of... How credible can you make this sound to a jury? We're, we're doing a podcast right now. We're, we're talking about it. We're discussing things that the defense attorneys have alleged. Even I have to admit, and, and I, know, uh, I, I know Andrew Baldwin socially. I don't know him personally. I, I don't know Brad Rossi at all. If it were any other attorney, I would say that these were clearly the ravings of a lunatic. Knowing... Baldwin and seeing the work that they put into this again I we you know we we we've been doing that we've been at this for for what about 50 minutes or something like that and we've barely scratched the surface like they they put significant work in this like they traveled to other states to speak with people who had information about this case you don't put that degree of work into something and not be capable of at least delivering it cohesively and coherently and passionately mm -hmm. I honestly think that this is enough of an argument that if it were in front of a jury, I do believe that this would carry the day on creating reasonable doubt. Even leaving out the bizarre confession of Elvis Fields, the remarkably creepy, huh, your Facebook is posting things that look an awful lot like a crime scene that nobody knows about from a guy whose son was dating one of the victims. Even leaving those things out is just like really, really, really weird coincidences. Yeah. The number of things that had to be done by a man working alone for this crime scene to have been organized the way that it was and to leave zero DNA evidence, leave zero forensic evidence of any kind, like not even cell phone evidence. Yeah. And, and Carroll County is admittedly a rural area and cell phone tower triangulation Let's be perfectly honest. It's junk science. I know that prosecutors want to tell you otherwise, but it's bunk. It's junk science. You still don't even have anything like that. Mm. That by itself, uh, you know, they they kind of in some ways, I think, telegraph what their argument to the jury is going to be. And I honestly think that it is a solid argument that might carry the day. There you go. Well, folks, we, we're going to circle back on this in our part three of, of this series and where we're diving into the state of Indiana against Richard Allen in this case. My goodness, uh, what an episode. <laughs> so many bits of information that have just exploded the state's case. It'll be really interesting, Jack, to sit down with you in part three and dive into, like you just mentioned, kind of the defense arguments surrounding uh, the Odinites guarding Richard Allen in prison. And then, of course, where this case goes from even from here beyond the Frank's motion itself. So Jack, I appreciate you and your time. Uh, looking forward to sitting back down with you next time. And uh, until then folks, we'll, uh, we'll catch you again. Yeah. I, I don't have a great sign off. It's like my, my mind is just as blown as yours is.
Yeah, I mean, exactly. And that's and that's what it is. Well, folks, here, I'll tell you what, if you did enjoy today's discussion, you like these case studies that Jack and I have been digging into of late on the show, make sure you subscribe on whichever platform you checked us out on today. That way you don't miss out on, on other great content like this, where whether or not we're doing case studies or we're diving into different avenues of criminal law, you know, we want to have some great conversations so that you can come out better educated and also enjoy, you know, have some fun along the way uh, when you spend your time with us. Before Jack, I'm Ryan. We're going to go ahead and say so long today, but we appreciate you stopping by and being with us on Closing Arguments.